for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for um, the fact that you are making intercession for us and that you continue to do so, will always do so, that perpetual, perfect obedience that is only found in Jesus Christ. Um, we're so grateful that we don't have to do that, um, that you were that for us. And so we rest this morning in that finished work and we rejoice that we are known by you, loved by you, kept by you, and will be forever and ever. What a wonderful salvation we have. Help us this morning to be mindful of the magnitude of that salvation, and may it press us, Lord, to communicate the wonders of it to other people. Help us to be good witnesses for you, ambassadors of the message of Christ, ones who are given the great opportunity to be proclaimers of a message of life and hope and liberty in Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and minds to receive the word this morning. Help us to understand it, to comprehend it, and to apply it to our lives out of gratitude for what you have done for us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Colossians, um, we are in chapter 4, and we've been looking at these verses, in particular verses 5 and 6. We've taken the time to uh, unpackage the meaning of these, and we've looked at other passages as well to help us better understand what our call is with regard to being effective witnesses uh, with respect to proclaiming the gospel, which is what we are called to do. The Great Commission is something that we uh, are certainly tasked with performing, and we want to make certain that we're doing it correctly. There's a right and a wrong way, and there's a message that is attendant with it that we need to make certain that we're understanding. And that's Paul's point, really. And so we begin with verse 2, just as a way of kind of laying the foundation again. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Now, this idea, this principle that Paul articulates in verse 4 is going to be found again in verse 6 with regard to how we witness, that there ought to be clarity and precision, and that there's a right and a wrong way with respect to how we witness and what we say when we witness. Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. As we know, wisdom is knowledge and action, and so there's a method by which we ought to be interacting with people. Outsiders are the unregenerate. So Paul is calling us to use what we know about the unsaved and to conduct ourselves accordingly, know your audience, making the most of the opportunity. Work while it is light, for the night comes, and you won't be able to work anymore, and you won't be able to do those things anymore. So labor now. Do it now. Communicate the gospel now. You do not know what tomorrow holds for you or for other people. Life is fleeting. It's a vapor, is what Scripture says. It passes by very quick, very fast. I'm shocked at how quick it passes. Every day I ponder how quickly it's passing. It's like going really fast. We keep having birthdays. Happy birthday, Deb. And they just keep coming. And I'm grateful that they keep coming, but I keep getting older. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Well, we find here then some important principles again, and I want to look in particular this morning at verse 6 before we move into the latter portions of this epistle. We'll probably get into verse 7 um, uh, to this morning as well, but I want to take the time this morning to at least wrap up and kind of tie up what we've been looking at with a nice bow and, and to make some of these final comments and conclusions. Certainly Paul here is concerned with how and what we say to each person that God brings to us. And this begs the question as to what is the message? Well, the message is certainly one that is tailored to deal with that individual in the context of what God has brought to you, but also to use the gospel to address whatever situation they find themselves in, which is what? A state of death, a state of needing the Lord. People need the Lord, and so this is what we're ultimately talking about. 
The idea that when God presents us with opportunity that we communicate to them, understanding our audience, their desperate need for a Savior. And there may be an approach or a way that you do that with a particular person with regard to where they are in their life or what they're facing in particular, but ultimately there needs to be a corresponding message that emphasizes the finished work of Christ and the answer in Christ. That's important. One of the things I like to do with people, and I'll just give this to you, and I've done this before, and I've asked these questions before, when I'm engaged with somebody and I'm talking to them, I will often ask them this, if you die, will you go to heaven? It's a good door opener. It's a good way to get a conversation going because people will typically want to talk about that. People have some sense of eternity. The Bible says that, that there is something beyond this realm, and I need to be attentive to that fact. It's written in all of our hearts in that way. The scripture says so. And so I will ask people at times, if you die, will you go to heaven? You know, we all have a conversation about something and we'll begin to talk about something else or maybe even in a conversation about someone else who has died and I'll make a comment with respect to a person's death and, and, and they'll say something about, well, he or she is in heaven and I'll say, what would happen if you died? Where would you be? Oftentimes they will say to me, well, I'll be in heaven. I'm going to heaven, and I'll say to them, well, why would God allow you in? What is the predicate? What's the foundation? What's the basis for being allowed into heaven? Do all dogs go to heaven? Well, according to the cartoon, they do. That's a great question to ask somebody. Why would God allow you in? I'll ask that question, and what am I often told? What am I given? all their works, all the good things that they've done, that at the end of the day, the balance of the scale tilts in their favor because of their good works, because of what they have done. I rarely ever hear about Jesus. Rarely ever hear about Jesus. It's all about them. It's all about what they've done, what they will continue to do, and how good they are. Well, Paul here, of course, would be concerned about that, and he um, talks about the idea of making certain that in our speech that we communicate a message of meaning, something that is seasoned with salt, it's savory, it's something that would garner someone's attention, rest their attention, if you will. In particular, we understand then that what Paul is talking about here in verse 6 is our speech with those he has identified in verse 5. That is with the unbelieving people he talks about. This is overt gospel proclamation. It includes our conversations with people, our times of proclaiming the gospel, and our routine interactions with the unbelieving and the watching world. Our speech needs to be registered in the context of that type of setting that Paul gives us. And so when I'm communicating with somebody, I need to make certain that I'm understanding what is at stake and what is in play. And it's critical. It's very critical. The book of Revelation makes that abundantly clear, does it not? People are under judgment. People need the Lord, and we need to be attentive to that fact, and we need to be prepared in that context to communicate with grace that message. Now, this idea of with grace is important. What does it mean? Does it mean passivity? Does it mean complacency? Does it mean that it's so gracious that it communicates nothing? That there is no message in it that we don't want to offend, that we're going to be gracious to the point that we're mute? unable to communicate anything? No, of course not. Paul says that our speech speech must always be with grace. And this phraseology that he uses here um, emphasizes the constant vigilance we must exercise over our conversation with the unbelieving. What Paul is saying to you and to me in this passage is that every word matters. Every interaction is essential. So I want you to think about that. Every word matters. Every interaction is essential. There's this idea of constant vigilance. 
And when he uses this phrase, with grace, that means that they are permeated with, empowered by, and engulfed in the grace that the Holy Spirit brings when he is in control. When he is in control. This speaks to a person who is familiar with God's Word, who understands their audience, who appreciates what the Holy Spirit has done in their life and is given over to the work of the Holy Spirit in their life and is remembering that their words need to be governed and controlled in that manner. So this phrase, grace, does not mean passivity or kindness to the point that you can't communicate essential truths. Rather, it simply means that we understand that we are being empowered by the Holy Spirit because we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And God has promised to give us the words that we need and the occasions that, given, that, that He gives to us in this context. There ought to be a sense in which people find us attractive as well. The word could be understood in that way too, that, that we are exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit in our demeanor and our behavior, the love, joy, peace, and patience, and long-suffering, and temperance, and meekness, and self-control that are attendant with the redeemed. We looked at Proverbs 11.30 last week about the one who wins souls is wise, but the predicate for that was that there is the demonstration of the fruit of the tree of righteousness that is in their life. And that makes their lives appealing to other people. They see something in us that is different. This is Paul's point with regard to this new creational lifestyle that we found in Colossians chapter 3, the way we interact in our marriages, the way that we interact with each other, the way that we demonstrate the Christian virtues, the way that we forbear and forgive. All of these things are demonstrations to the world that we are different. It makes our lives savory or salty. It is the very salt and light that Christ speaks of in The similitudes in Matthew chapter 5. It is the very light that we should not hide under a bushel and that we should shine forth in a dark world. This is what what Paul is speaking to here. And as we live out this gracious life, this life of transformation, this life that's that's, that's demonstrating these fruits springing from that tree of righteousness within us, the Holy Spirit we then season that conversation, those interactions with salt. And this describes our role in the world as disciples of Christ. We know that from Matthew 5. We've looked at that. It's interesting that in the ancient world, salt could be used either as a seasoning for food or as a fertilizer for the ground. As such, it becomes an example of the qualities of an ideal disciple of Jesus Christ. Paul here uses this word seasoned as well. That's interesting to use, and that indicates that Paul is using it with the connotation of how food is seasoned by salt. It's made better, is it not? I I mean, I would say that it does help. I mean, too much salt is not good, but some salt is helpful. Fries without salt aren't very enjoyable. I like salt on my green beans along with bacon grease. Who doesn't, right? I mean, come on now. Can I hear an amen to that? Yeah, amen, yeah. And so seasoned. So there's the idea, too, that in the, in the way that we would season food with salt, we, too, then are seasoning our language with the unredeemed with a salt, a savory in us that is, um, makes it flavorful in some way and, and, and makes it attractive in some way. That we, are, that we have prepared our speech. Our speech has been made ready to be savory, appealing, tasteful. Our speech is palatable and thus beneficial to the unbelieving. Well, what, what, would, be un, what would be beneficial to the unbelieving? What, what would be the most beneficial thing to the unbelieving? As I'm seasoning my, my, my conversation, as I'm making it savory, what is it that's making it savory? Well, I'm going to give them a message that they desperately need to hear about Jesus Christ. That's what it's going to be. Again, this is not the Jesus jelly approach. I'm not going to spread a little Jesus over their problem. I'm going to go to the heart of the matter. I'm going to talk to them about their desperate need for Jesus Christ. Talk to him, talk to them about who he is and what he has done. And that's important, and that's what disciples do. 
This speech, of course, could be characterized as something that is winsome or even witty to some degree. It's interesting and it's fruitful um, in some dynamic or context. But here's the important thing, and this is something I want you to be very clear about, because as I have said, I have seen and heard and others use this passage in a way that takes away its impact and its power, that somehow we make our speech so appealing and so appeasing that it loses all profitability. But Paul here is speaking here to the idea of the profit, the profitability of the message and not the pleasure of the hearer. It's not the pleasure of the unbelieving which is in view, but their profit spiritually. Keep that in mind. Paul here is concerned about the fact that you and I have a message to give to each of these persons that God brings into our life and that our concern is not their pleasure, but to profit them spiritually. We communicate to them the message of the gospel. Relying upon the Holy Spirit, we, con- we care front, if you want to use it that way, or we, we bring the gospel to them and we talk to them about who Jesus Christ is because that is for their profit spiritually, because they desperately need Him. They desperately need Him. This kind of speech would, and Paul would anticipate, would provoke interest by wise engagement with these people. The example we find of this is in Acts 17 when Paul confronts those who are gathered together worshiping the unknown God, and he just kind of goes in and starts talking about who they're worshiping and what they're worshiping. But let me tell you about who the real God is not a very lengthy conversation, at least as recorded in Scripture, but the consequence of it was that God used it to save people, as recorded in the book of Acts. He's also not causing us, he's not charging us to be so clever or trying to use the cleverness of our speech to somehow garner people's attention or to lead them into Christ, because that was condemned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.17. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So the idea is not to demean and to diminish the message so much that there has no punch to it or savoriness to it or salt, but to engage under the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that brings the message to a person in a real demonstrable way, that talks to them about their need for Jesus Christ. Perhaps they raise with you a situation that they're facing. Perhaps a loved one has recently died. Perhaps there's some other problem that they're facing. And yes, we're going to be concerned about that problem, but we're going to ultimately take them to the ultimate problem, and that is their heart before God and where they stand in the context of His judgment and the resolution and the solution to that being Jesus Christ. This is so important for us, and and Paul is certainly concerned that we need to be understanding of what he is saying here. He is, of course, making certain that we use our words wisely. That's why at the beginning he would pray as he does for their wisdom and understanding of God's word. As I've noted before, wisdom is knowledge and action. You understand God's word, and you have an urgency about you to communicate it to people. Well, what is the goal here, ultimately? Paul talks about that. In verse 6, the latter part, he says, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. To each person. This is quite unique. The idea here is that we're not talking about a cookie-cutter pattern as it relates to evangelism, but that this is uniquely tailored to each person that God brings providentially into our lives. Not a cookie-cutter approach to evangelism, a one-size-fits-all, but to be attentive to the fact that God brings into our lives a variety of different people. 
at different places in their lives, in different situations, different family circumstances, different educational backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, societal backgrounds, economic backgrounds. There's a litany of things that come into our lives during the course of our lives that are varied and, 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 and significant that way. And so Paul is saying here that evangelism is of such concern that you and I in the engagement with these people are prepared based upon our understanding of God's word, understanding our audience to be prepared to communicate to each of these people uniquely the gospel. That's amazing. That's a pretty significant call. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter basically says the same thing, that you're able to give an account for the hope that is within you. And each of those people may be different in some way. And so here, he wants us to respond. That's an interesting phrase. How you should respond, it begs the question or it it sets it up as such that it appears that some question has been posed and that you need to answer it uniquely in the context of what you are engaged in at that moment with that person. And ultimately, he's concerned that you would do it clearly. In this case, it is specifically focused on our conversation with unbelievers regarding faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a way which we should reply in such cases, again, hearkening back to 1 Peter 3.15, when asked, Peter says, you then give this account of the hope that is within you. It's interesting, too, that the word that Paul uses here in verse, in verse 6 is that same word we find in verse 4 to describe the way Paul believes he should speak the gospel message, which is what? Clearly. Clearly. Don't fog it up. Don't make it so vague that they walk away that they just need to be a good person to be saved. I hope that you're talking about Jesus and not just goodness because that's not the gospel at all. And our tendency, I will tell you what the tendency is. Our tendency is to deflect off the gospel when people start to talk about being good. Because we're okay, the, the, the idea of someone being good is, okay, oh, I can get there, I can, I, can, I can live with that. Friend, when they start talking about good, this is what you need to be attentive to. Each person, you need to be thinking to yourself, they're focused on their own works. I'm going to talk to them about someone else's work. I'm going to talk to them about Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk to them about Jesus Christ. This is what Paul means. Our call, like Paul's call when preaching, is to do the gospel proclamation with clarity. Paul even instills in this, based upon the grammatical structure and the different tenses that he uses, a sense of obligation or necessity about the kind of reply made in conversations with unbelieving people. And this is not wisdom and grace considered merely in a general way toward the unbelieving. Rather, the obligation is specific to each one that you may encounter. The emphasis is not on everyone you may meet, but upon each separate person. That's unbelievable. That's what he says. You will know how, to, how you should respond to each person, each person. So what this means is this. We're not just going to give somebody the Roman road. We're not going to give them the four spiritual laws, and don't you ever do that. Paul here is not calling for a cookie-cutter approach to evangelism. He is calling for real-time, spirit-born wisdom and grace to be applied in the specifics of each encounter with each person. That's interesting to me because I, I, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but this is kind of the struggle that I have with track evangelism. Is there anything wrong with a track? Not necessarily, but the problem is you hand them the track and you walk away. Now what? There's been none of this. There's been no conversation seasoned with salt, empowered by the Holy Spirit, specifically tailored to that person. Now, may a track be used as a segue into a conversation? Certainly it can, but you're going to have to hang around for a minute 
maybe read it to them, and then begin to answer the questions that the track may raise in their mind. This is the point. Now, can God use a track? Sure, he can. He uses all sorts of things, but that does not negate our obligation to be engaged with people in such a way that we go beyond the mere passive act of handing someone something and engaging more objectively and actively with them as called here by Paul. To be really engaged in one-on-one evangelism, to be engaged with that person, to be using your language and your speech and what you know about Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. This is real-time, spirit-born wisdom and grace. The emphasis here is not on learning a method of gospel presentation, but upon personal dependence upon the Holy Spirit to produce in one's heart and mind the wisdom and grace essential to making the most effective use of each and every encounter with an unbeliever. To be prepared for that. Interestingly enough, it considers people as, as, an in, as individuals, not as merely a category. It's personal. It's very personal. It recognizes that we must listen carefully to each person that God sovereignly puts before us. Remember back before, we're praying, we're praying that God would open doors. Paul's asking for that. We too are similarly praying for ourselves in that way. God, open doors for me. Give me opportunities to talk to people. Maybe you're going to pray that with regard to your children. Maybe a colleague at work. God, give me these opportunities. Open these doors for me. Help me to do it with clarity. May it be spirit-empowered. May my words be savory and salty so they may see Christ. Give me the opportunity to talk to people about Jesus Christ. It also reminds us that each encounter demands fresh grace coming down from God, flowing through us and onto the person with whom we are interacting. We are saved by His grace. We live in His grace. We're empowered by His grace, especially in the context of evangelism. And so, that's so very, very important. And I hope that you have a burden for the lost, and I hope that our time in this passage and in this topic has whetted your appetite to be engaged with people in a more meaningful way and consistent with Scripture more consistent with the exhortation that we have received here with respect to how to properly proclaim the gospel and to take advantage of open doors that God brings to us. Remember, nothing is a mistake. There are no maverick molecules. The people that you meet, God intended for you to meet. God has brought them to you to meet. That's unique, is it not? I don't believe in fate. I don't meet people by mistake. I have never met anybody by mistake. God brought them to me. God brought them to me. Well, we leave that portion of Colossians now. We have concluded our examination of the indicative and imperatives of the epistle. To some degree, there are some that remain in these uh, balance of verses. Let's look here then at Colossians chapter 4, and let's read at verse 7. As Paul now begins to point out his gospel partners, and to um, introduce them to the Colossi church. Some perhaps knew these folks, and to introduce them to us for all of church history. What a remarkable thing it is that we have a list here of a multitude of names that have been recorded for all of church history for us to know and to reflect upon. That's not by mistake. There's a reason that these names are here, and we ought to know about them and to consider them. So we begin in verse 7, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant, and the Lord will bring you information. For I have, sent, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know that about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him Onesimus, that, the slave that we've talked about before that belonged to Philemon, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas's cousin, Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. 
and also Jesus who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, we know Epaphras, the, the minister there at Colossae, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. What a contrast among, with, between the faithful and the faithless there in that verse. We'll have more to say about Demas, who later on is recorded in the Scripture to have forsaken Paul for the present world. Verse 15, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea. This is an interesting idea here that we'll get into. The church in Laodicea. Wow. Interesting. They're meeting at a lady's house named Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. We don't have that letter preserved um, through the history. God did not see fit to keep that as part of the canon of Scripture. Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Archippus is Epaphras' successor at the church in Colossae. He becomes the minister there in his absence. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, remembering my, remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Well, who are these people? And we'll talk a little bit about them. We have a, ho a, a whole cast of characters. We have 12 Bible characters mentioned, including Paul, in the final 12 verses of chapter 4, and one church. Ephesians chapter 6 mentions uh, Tychicus as well, and we'll look at that in a moment. And it's a varied and diverse cast of characters. Some who have had problems spiritually, some who would have problems later on, some who were great pillars of trust and confidence, others who had demonstrated weakness at times, yet they are all here in service of the Lord. God can use a variety of people. I think one of the sobering things for me is the fact that the church of Laodicea is mentioned. We find them in Revelation 3.14, and what the Lord has to say to them is not very good. They are the lukewarm church. They are the church who waffles. And something happened in the context of their light in the world and Regrettably, it's not a good testimony. Well, let's talk about um, Tychicus and who he is and what he was doing. And by all accounts, based upon what we know here from verse 7, Paul is very trusting of Tychicus. He has entrusted him with Paul's affairs and his personal items. He notes, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant, and the Lord will bring you information. For I sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. One of the things I find unique about this is this kind of bond, uh, this gospel bond that everybody has here. That they're all engaged with each other in the proclamation of the gospel, some at great personal sacrifice and some traveling great distances to do it. We know that Paul is in prison. Likely, Epaphras is with him in prison too. It's interesting that some historians believe that Epaphras volunteered to be imprisoned with Paul. That's interesting. In order to be with him and to help him, that's significant. But here we have Tychicus. We find him also in the book of Ephesians. Let's turn over there. Ephesians 6.21 makes reference to him. Similar to what we have read in Colossians chapter 4, Paul writes here in Ephesians 6.21, but that you also may know about my circumstances. So we understand then that Tychicus was taking back a message about what was going on with Paul, what was happening to him, where was he, what was happening in regard to his imprisonment and ministry, things of that nature how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, and that he may comfort your hearts. 
Well, we understand then from this two separate references to Tychicus that he is clearly a man of the faith, that he is one who Paul refers to as a beloved brother, a faithful servant, and a fellow bond servant. So there's three categories in which Paul cast Tychicus that are important for us and I think are examples of what we too should be with respect to our service to each other and within the body of Christ. This is how we ought to and want to be remembered. Our legacy ought to be similar to that of Tychicus. We all should all strive to have a, a, a legacy that is reflective of these types of descriptions. It's a good way to be remembered, I think. And I think it's significant that for all of church history, for all of our lives here today in Beloit, Ohio, some 2,000 years later, we're reading and understanding about Tychicus. That's significant. And so the characteristics that he has and has exhibited through his life are important to us. We understand that he's a beloved brother. So Paul, I mean, Christ would say that you'll know you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. So he's identified then simply by this phrase as a viable, real disciple of Jesus Christ because of his love. Because the way that he has loved Paul and the church and others in it, the way that he has made sacrifice, he is a beloved brother. He has demonstrated the reality of who he is by the way he loves. That's significant for us, too, to be reminded of that example. Tychicus obviously was a man of outstanding character, loyalty, and faithfulness. And this is why Paul felt confident in entrusting to him his own personal affairs. Not only his own personal affairs, but what we also find is that he was the courier of both this letter, the letter for the Ephesians and Philemon, and 2 Timothy, which is significant. And also the letter to the Laodiceans that is referenced here in Colossians 4.16. So he was a trusted courier, a beloved brother, somebody that Paul could trust. These deep relationships that we find here communicated to us in Colossians chapter 4 were forged through joint service in the gospel ministry, joint identification as the redeemed of Christ, an indication and an, and an indication that they deeply loved each other. Deep, brotherly, Christian affection. Significant. Paul says that he is a faithful servant. This speaks not only to his own personal service to Paul, but his handling of God's word. That he was a man capable in the word of God, and he rightly divided it, and that he was one who had been engaged in the very things that Paul was calling the Colossae church to in verses 5 and 6. That he was an example of that, that he was one who cared about the things of God and was clear in his presentation of the gospel. This is what we want in the church. And that he was a fellow bondservant. That language, that word bondservant is significant. It speaks to the idea of being a slave. That Paul, like Paul himself, Tychicus too was a bondservant of Christ, given over to Christ, fully committed to all that he would call him to do, following and obeying his master in all circumstances with loyalty and affection and great love. These are the earmarks of the true disciples of Christ. Now, did Tychicus sin ever? Absolutely. Was he a sinner saved by grace? Absolutely. But he demonstrated the reality of it by his service to Christ, to, to the church, and to his willingness to sacrifice all for Christ. That's what these words speak to here. In verse 8, Paul talks about the reason why he sends them there to communicate these things, that you may know about our circumstances. He's referring to Timothy, who's with him, and Epaphras as well, to tell them what's going on, to get the news, right? News was slow back then. Remember how far away they were. It's a long ways from Rome to Colossae. It's a long walk. So we have a faithful brother taking care of Paul. While Paul could not take care of himself, Tychicus was taking care of the business, and he was sent to be an encouragement. So he's going to go and minister. He was going to communicate things to these people in Colossae 
who loved Epaphras and who would have known of Paul and Timothy and would have been concerned about them. And so he went there to encourage them to let them know that they're still engaged in gospel ministry. And oh, by the way, here's a letter from him that I'm going to read to you from Paul because he's concerned about what's going on in this church. So I think it's a great example for us and a good way to be mindful of what our call is with respect to serving each other and living for the Lord that way. Well, Onesimus is the next character that we find in verse 9. And I'm going to stop here this morning because Onesimus is a complex character and we're going to be talking about him more in the book of Philemon. But we know that he was a slave who stole money from Philemon, who ran away and by God's providence was encountered by Paul in Rome and then sent back as a co-courier with Tychicus to bring the letter of, Coloss- the, the letter of Colossians to the, that very church. That's significant. And what it also says to me is this, that when God saves us, our past doesn't matter anymore. Don't you love that? You got a slave. Now think about that for a minute. You've got, what a contrast in characters. Tychicus, the faithful bondservant, loyal servant of Paul, courier of epistles, preacher of the gospel, with Onesimus, the runaway thief slave. Only God can do that, right? And he puts these two guys together and he says, you're going to take these letters back and you're going to read them and you're going to proclaim them. What an, what an amazing example of God's grace in regards to who he will use and how he can use them. Who would have ever thought about it? Who would have ever thunk it, right? As my dad used to say. Well, God works in mysterious ways, and we're grateful for that. We'll leave off there, and we'll return next week, Lord willing, to wrap up our discussion of these various characters that we find here in the balance of chapter 6. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day in your word. Thank you for the reminder of these characters and who they are. Thank you for the reminders of what it means to be a gospel witness and how to do it. Lord, forgive us for not being more attentive to those issues and not being um, prepared in the way that we ought to be, depending upon and relying upon the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would continue to open doors for us to talk to people about you, about Christ, and proclaim the word to them. We pray that you would do that for your glory and for your honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.